Hello. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vince, one of the pastors here at High Point Church. Good to see everybody. Yes, 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 yes. Hey, if you're new, we're especially glad you're here. And we would um, really, we really hope you connect with somebody before you leave. Feel free to come talk to me after the service. I will be in the lobby on the right side. I'll talk a little bit more at, about that at the end. And, uh, but there's lots of friendly people here. We hope you'll leave um, having met a few people. We have been doing this series called Entrusted. And this series is all about stewardship. I would guess most of us in this room do not use the word stewardship very often. Like, I'm a steward. That's not a very common word that we use anymore, but this is a word that's used all throughout the Bible, and it's a very important word um, in terms of who we are as Christians. A modern-day example of a steward would maybe be like a restaurant manager. Like a lot of restaurant managers, they don't own the restaurant, but they're in charge of it. That's what God says about us. He says, you don't own the world, but I've entrusted you to be in charge of it. I've left you in charge. And he gives us some guidelines and he intervenes directly sometimes, but he has entrusted our lives, our relationships with each other and this whole world for us to take care of and grow and, and all that kind of thing. So if you want to learn more about stewardship, you can go to highpointchurch.org and um, catch up on all the things we've learned about stewardship over the last like five or six weeks. All of these sermons have come from um, the book of Luke, which is one of the books in the Bible that tells the story of Jesus. Today, though, we're going to talk about just one aspect of stewardship, and that is stewarding our sense of urgency. Now, if I asked you to raise your hand and say, raise your hand if you feel like you're already living an urgent life, most of us would probably say that we are. We're always rushing around, running around, trying to keep up, trying to get everything done. But what we're talking about today is not that kind of urgency. What we're talking about is a sense of urgency in dealing with the big issues some spiritual issues, maybe some sin that you find yourself caught in, maybe some aspects of who you are that you know need to change, but you've been putting off for a long time. When it comes to those big issues, problems, sin struggles, character things we've been putting off, most of us like to live like we'll live forever. We like to live like we'll live forever, meaning we like to put those things off like we'll live forever. Like we've always got more time to work on that stuff. I'll deal with that later. Let me give you a couple kind of silly examples from my own life. This isn't really like the big issues of life, but this is just to give you the concept of how we push important things off. I drive a red Ford ZX2 from 2002. It is a small two-door car stick shift. I feel very proud of myself that I learned how to drive a stick shift. I love that car. And recently, the check engine light went on in the car. Now, a car from 2002, when the check engine light goes on, you're like, I got to deal with that, you know, because you don't want it to, like, blow up or something while you're driving down the road. So I saw the check engine light, and I thought, this is a big problem with my car. So two months later, I took it in. Why did I wait two months? Because it's a big issue. And I like to drive my car like it's going to drive forever. Again, I'm like, oh, I'll deal with that check engine light later. And I'll deal with it later, even though I know full well it's a big issue. So I bring it in, and I don't bring it to a mechanic because that would be too big of a step. I bring it to, like, one of those guys where they plug in the computer and read the code and just tell you what's wrong with it. I'm like, that feels like the right step for this moment. So I go to the guy, and he's like, you got to take this thing in, in a bad way. He's like, the catalytic converter's going, it's, other stuff's going wrong. you got to take it in now. And I was like, oh, wow, I figured. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. I'll bring it in. Now it's been about six weeks since then. <laughs> Have I brought it in? No. No, I haven't. I haven't. Why? Because I don't want to think about it. I just want to keep driving my car. We like to live like we'll live forever. I like to drive my car like I'll drive forever. And one of the ways that um, we put things off like we'll live forever is we always feel kind of like it's on the schedule just for some other time. 
So another kind of silly example, this is going to be TMI for some of you, um, but I'm just going to tell you because it's funny and it's a good illustration. So when I was little, I was late in the potty training game. You know what I'm saying? I blame it on my parents. I'm pretty sure you can blame that on your parents, right? You're a little kid. You don't, you don't like, if you're like, I don't want to go on the potty, they're supposed to be like, go on the potty. But for whatever reason, they waited too long. I, I'm not going to say how long. I, there's a number in my head that I'm not sure if it's right or not, but I'm just not going to say it because I don't want to be embarrassed. And for you to judge my parents, although they probably deserve it. Anyways. So this is what I would do. I knew, obviously, every kid knows they're supposed to go on the potty. So my parents would go, Vincy, when are you going to go on the potty? And you know what I'd say? Friday. It was on my schedule. It was on my schedule for Friday. And then Friday would come, and Friday would go. Would I go on the potty? No, no, no. <laughs> and then they'd say, Vincy, when are you going to go on the potty? And I'd say, Friday. That was my strategy. We still do this today. We don't say Friday because we know if you say a specific day, somebody's going to be all up in your grill saying, you got to stick to what you said. So we have invented an eighth day of the week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then eighth day, someday. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm going to do that someday. Someday soon. Yeah, I'm totally going to do I really need to do that someday soon. I, everybody said that in here. And oftentimes we do that with our biggest problems, our biggest issues. So let me ask you this. What's marked on your calendar for someday? What's going on in your life right now that you've said, someday I'm going to deal with that? Some of you, your marriage is not what it was, not what it could be. And if someone maybe has said to you, or maybe you've said to each other, yeah, we really got to work on this. We got to get some counseling. We got to talk to somebody, or we got to read a book, or go to a class, or I don't know, something. And you're like, you're both like, yes, 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 we need to do that. But we got soccer practice Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we've got piano lessons Tuesday, Thursday, and your in-laws, who we both know I love, are coming in this weekend, so let's plan to do that on someday. You know what I'm saying? We'll do it someday. Maybe you got some financial struggles and you're like, my income has slowly gone up every year. Great. But guess what else has happened? My spending has gone up just ahead of it. And you got some credit card debt and you're like hearing Nick talk about that financial peace class. And you're like, yes, I'm totally going to do that. And I'm going to schedule it on my calendar for Someday. I'll do it someday. I totally need to do that someday. Some of you are caught in addiction, alcohol, pornography, pills, whatever it is. People are sitting here going, no, there's no way anybody in here. Oh, yes, there is. There are people who come into this room every single week with secret and sometimes not so secret addictions. And you go, I really, I really do need to deal with this. So I'm going to start going to AA or I'm going to start going to a group. Or I'm going to start doing a thing. I'm going to put it on my calendar. I'm going to mark it for... Someday. I'll do it someday. Some of you, it might not be like a crisis kind of thing, but here, like, here's an example. Some of you are like deep in the church world. You're like, this is my place. I serve. I show up every week. But it's been a while since you actually talked to God. It's been a while since you sat down with the Lord at least on a regular basis, to try to grow your relationship with him. And you're like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I want to pray. I want to read the Bible. I want to spend time with God. But I got youth group on Wednesday night, and I got worship on Saturday night, and then I serve as a greeter Sunday morning. So I'm going to actually connect with God on... Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. This is what we do. We put it on the calendar in our heads for Sunday. Some of you, some of you in this room, like, you're just not very nice. You're kind of a jerk. And people have said, you're kind of a jerk. And you're like, yeah, I am kind of a jerk. I got to deal with that on someday. Some of you are going like relationship to relationship to relationship, back to back. And your friends have been like, Tinder, got to go. Hinge, got to go. You got to like take a year off of dating and you're like you're totally right but cindy's 25th is saturday and i've got a date on friday already so i'm gonna delete all that stuff on 
someday we put, we put it off, we put it off, we put it off. This is what we do oftentimes with the, the big issues of our life. The stuff that we know we need to deal with most. The stuff that really matters. Like the stuff if you could rate and you say, this is probably the most important thing in my life. We put it off like we're going to live forever. We put it off like time is our butler. Like we just go, um, excuse me, Alfred, can I get some more time to deal with this? And he's like, here you go. More time. We live like we'll live forever. So what's marked on your calendar for someday? Here's the deal. We're going to look at a story of Jesus, where Jesus talks to a group of people that are doing this. They have taken their most significant spiritual issue and have pushed it out of their minds and said, we will deal with this later. As we look at the story and as we see that spiritual issue, for some of you in this room, their issue, the people in the story, is your issue. And you're going to hear this and go, wow, that's really heavy for me. Some of you are going to go, yeah, that's not really my issue. But before you tune out, we are going to connect it to everybody here because the people in this story, their specific issue might not be your issue, but the way they handle their issue is how we do, where they push it off, push it off, push it off. So in part one of the story, Jesus brings this to their attention. He says, listen, you don't think this is an issue or you've ignored it or whatever, but this is the big issue in your life. And then the second half of the story, um, he deals with their tendency, which is the same as my tendency, which is the same as your tendency, to put it off, put it off, put it off until the last minute, to live like they're going to live forever. And he addresses that directly. Make sense? Sound good? You guys are ready to read the Bible? We're reading the Bible. We're doing it old school in here, reading the good word of the Lord. So if you got a Bible, pull it out. And if you uh, don't, you can pull one from the pew, the seat in front of you. These things are called pews that you're sitting in. If you don't go to church a lot, you might not know that. It's a very weird name. Why would they call it a pew? I don't know. Somebody in here probably knows, but we're not going to get into that. If you want to pull out a Bible app on your phone, you can do that. You can follow along on the screen. Also, we're going to have the verses up there. We're going to go to the book of Luke, chapter 13. Who has the page number if you have a pew Bible? 1588. Look it up in there. Jesus has been traveling around, preaching, teaching, doing miracles, being amazing everywhere he goes. And then he happens upon a group of people with this issue, and he has a conversation with them, and that's what we're going to look at right now. So here's how it goes down. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. If there was ever a confusing verse to start a sermon with, this would have to be it. Like, what is going on? That sounds like it doesn't relate at all to anything you were talking about. I didn't know what this meant either when I started studying for it, um, so I had to learn, so you're not alone if you don't know what's going on. Here's what's going on. The people in this story, the ones who are here at this present time, come to Jesus with a news story. And they say, I don't know if you've heard about this, but a group of Galileans was on their way to the temple with sacrifices. The act of bringing sacrifices to the temple was an act of devotion, an act at the time that would be seen as like a good and proper and right thing to do to grow in your relationship with God. And the people talking to Jesus says, did you hear about those Galileans? They were on their way to the temple, and Pilate, who was a Roman governor, came and killed them. Now, when we hear a story like this, where somebody undeservedly, you know, gets killed or something bad happens to them, we feel really sad. This was a different time and a different culture. And to them, what this said was, if those people were on their way to do something good, and then they got killed, that must mean they must have done something really bad in secret. There was a firmly held belief that if something bad happened to you, that meant that you were a bad person. And if something really bad happened to you when it looked like you were doing something good, that meant you were a really bad person. That's the commonly held belief that people had at the time. So basically what these people are doing are coming to Jesus 
with their finger pointed at someone else. They're saying, hey, Jesus, look over there. Look at those people. They're saying um, in a way that they probably feel is very subtle and like, oh, he'll never realize this is what we're doing. But what they're doing is they're trying to say, Jesus, tell me I'm a good person. As I point out these bad people over here, tell me I'm a good person. They had, in this moment, a belief that if they could point the finger at someone else and say, I'm better than this person, that meant things must be all good with them and God. They believed, if I can prove myself to be a good person, that must mean things are all good between me and God. This is a problem in Jesus' mind, and when we read the scripture, we realize that that's actually not what the Bible teaches. Some of you here in this room, though, think about yourself that way. Remember I said Jesus is bringing a problem to the surface? The problem that he's bringing to the surface, for some of you, this is your problem. This is your issue, is that you think, if I'm a good person, things must be all good between me and God. Anywhere you go in our culture, anybody you talk to, you'll, the people will say, I don't know what I believe. I don't know how I'm spiritual, but not religious, but I'm a good person. So things must be okay with me and God. I was just talking to a friend the other day, and he said, I think, I don't know if there's a God, but if there is, I know that things are going to be all good when I die between me and God because I'm a basically good person. That's what the people in this story were doing. They were coming to Jesus with their finger pointed at someone else saying, aren't I a good person? Isn't everything okay between me and God because I'm basically a good person? And Jesus is about to point out to them that this is not reality. So here's what Jesus says. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. He says, you're pointing your finger at those people saying, oh, they're worse than everybody else. Jesus says, you shouldn't do that. They're not worse than anybody else. They're just the same as everybody else. At which point, we would hope and we would think and some of us would believe that he would say, guess what? They were actually good people. And you're actually a good people. No need to point the finger at anybody else because we're all good people. But if you've read the Bible at all or learned about who Jesus is, this is not how Jesus rolls. Here's what he said to them. He said, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. That's heavy. That's some heavy stuff. Some of you haven't been to church in a while. You're like, I knew it. I knew this is what it was going to be like. They were going to say, you're all going to hell. Listen, these are not my words. Don't come getting mad at me. This is what Jesus said. Jesus, the most famous person of all time, we believe he was God, but Everyone in the world knows who he is, except for very, very remote places. Even other religions hold Jesus to be a sinless, perfect prophet from God, a perfect teacher from God. Jesus is one of the few religious rulers in the world that there's no black mark associated with his name. If you go and research other religions and trace it back to the person who started it, there's all sorts of rumors. Oh, yeah, they were actually a bad person. They were actually doing this thing. There's none of that with Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus. I was talking to someone in our apartment just the other day, and she was like, uh, yeah, I don't really believe in Jesus in terms of like the way you would as a Christian, but I have a shrine to Jesus in my room filled with statues of Jesus that I pray to all the time. Everybody loves Jesus for good reason, because Jesus loves the world, and he came to seek and save the lost. But he has some hard words, and here's what he's saying to them. He's saying, if you think you're all good with God because you're a good person, you are not all good with God. He says, unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now, I want to talk you through what repentance means. Because some of you hear repentance, and you think repentance means being an even better person. 
Yeah, maybe I'm not good enough, but if I repent, well, maybe Jesus wants me to be an, an even better person, and that's not at all what he is saying. When he said, I need you to repent, he is saying something that would have made immediate sense to them as Israelite people, because this is a word that has been used all throughout their history. So we're going to do like a 30-second history lesson right now so you understand the meaning of the word repent, okay? 2,000 or so years before this, there was a guy named Abraham, and God said, hey, Abraham, I've got a plan for you. Gonna make your children into a great nation and bless the world through you. We, some of you are looking at me like, what is going on? This has got so weird so fast. We just made a kid CD that tells the story of Abraham. That's one of the songs from the CD and blah, 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 blah. Anyways, God came to Abraham. I want you to picture God up here talking to Abraham. And God came to Abraham and said, talking this way, picture me as Abraham. God's over here. And, Ab and God said, Abraham, I'm all about you and your kids and their kids and your descendants being all about me. He says, I'm all about you being all about me. I want to know you in a special way. I just don't want to have an everyday kind of relationship with you. I don't want to just know you a little bit. I don't want you to see me as some God way out in heaven somewhere, way distant place. I want to know you, and I want to be known through you. I want the rest of the world, when they look at you, Abraham, and your kids, and your nation, and your descendants, I want them to look at you and say, those people know God. They've got a connection with God and that the rest of the world would say, we want what they have. God wanted to be known through the Israelites. So over hundreds of years, that was their purpose. And sometimes it went okay. They'd be facing God. They'd be connected to him. They'd be praying to him. They'd be worshiping him in the way that he wanted to be worshiped. But inevitably, over and over and over again, they would turn away. They'd walk away from God. And then God would send a prophet and say, Israel, remember, I'm all about you being all about me. And then they'd say, oh, yeah. Then they'd turn back and come back to God. Then some more time would go away. And they'd go, ah, I'm interested in some other things. Or I'm just losing interest in God. And they'd turn away. And then God would send more prophets. And they would say, Israel, remember. What the prophets would say is this word right here repent. That was the word that they would use. They'd say, repent, repent, repent. And repent meant turn back to God. Repent meant remember it's all about you being all about God, connected to God, in a relationship with him, knowing him, him knowing you. So when Jesus said, if you do not repent, you're going to perish, what he was saying is, if you don't turn back to God, and be all about him, you are going to perish. And when he says perish, he is, um, you know, referencing this story that they just told him about the people getting killed. And then he actually tells another one right here. Jesus tells another story to make the point even more clear. He says, or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Jesus brings up his no own news story about a group of people that went to Jerusalem, were there worshiping God, doing the right thing, being good people, and a tower fell on them. And he said, don't assume they're worse than anybody else. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But he says, but unless you repent, unless you turn back to God, you too will all perish. He is not saying that a tower is going to fall on them or they're going to cut up or, you know, get killed by a pilot or whatever. He's saying, if you don't turn to God in this life, you are going to perish in the afterlife. That's what the Bible, that's the word Jesus is using in terms of what the Bible talks about hell. He's saying if you do not turn to Jesus in this life, you are not going to be with him in the afterlife. What Jesus is saying to them is the same thing he's saying to you. He is pointing out this problem that some of you in this room have, that you think if I'm a good person, I'm all good with God. And Jesus is saying if you do not have a relationship with God in this life, you cannot expect a relationship with God in the next life. Let me say that again. If you do not have, and I want you to hear this, if you do not have a relationship with God in this life, 
You cannot expect a relationship with God in the next life. That feels heavy, but this is makes complete sense. Think about this. I'm married, right? Coming up on two years now. Praise the Lord. My wife's name is Joanna. If let's say Joanna is standing in the place of God, this is a metaphor. This is a metaphor. She is not actually God. If Joanna is standing here and we're married, we're holding hands, and I say, Joanna, I don't want to be with you anymore. I am turning away from you. I'm done with you. I'm going to go live my life. Let's say I leave her and I live a very good life. I'm really nice to people. I give money away. I love everyone. Maybe, you know, we're in Madison. Maybe I'm even vegan or something like that. You know, or paleo or who knows. I guess paleo wouldn't be good if you thought vegan was good, but you know what I mean. I live an amazingly wonderful moral life. I'm a great person. Then I die and she dies. And then I come to her in the next life and I say, Joanna, we're good, right? What's she going to say? No. Well, what if I said, but Joanna, I lived such a good life. I was such a good person. She's going to be like, I don't care. You said no to a relationship with me in your life. So if you say no to a relationship with me in this life, how can you expect that we would have a relationship in the next life? God says the same thing to us. Jesus is saying the same thing to these people. Jesus, if you're here today and you think being good makes you all good with God, Jesus is saying being good does not matter. If you don't have a relationship with God in this life, you can't expect a relationship with God in the next life. That's what Jesus said. Don't even go in your head, oh, that's what the Bible said. This is what Jesus said. Now, before you hear this, Christians, and go, okay, well, good thing this sermon doesn't apply to me because I've already said yes to Jesus. As Christians, maybe we have repented. Maybe we've said, okay, I know that I'm supposed to be facing towards God and I'm all about him and I have turned away from all that stuff and I've turned towards God. Don't we sometimes have one thing turned the other way? We got our finances back here. And, or we've got our marriage back here, or we've got the secret addiction. We say, God, you can have all of me except for this thing. Don't look over here, Lord. The call to repent is the same for us. This is maybe kind of a, a weird way to put it, but your soul can be saved while your marriage is perishing. Your soul can be saved while your finances are perishing. Your soul can be saved while your ministry is perishing. Your soul can be saved while your relationships are perishing. Your soul can be saved while lots of stuff in your life is going to fall apart because you're not dealing with it. Jesus says the same thing to all of us. He says, whatever you don't repent of is going to perish. If you don't bring your whole life to me, then your whole life is going to perish. But whatever you don't bring to me is going to perish. This is what Jesus says. Heavy, 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 heavy. I know, I know, but you can't, you can't soften the words of our Savior, but it gets better. It gets better. There's more to the story. So in this moment, that was kind of the end of part one where Jesus says, this is your problem. Your problem is that you think being good will get you all good with God. Being good makes you all good with God. He says, that's your problem. And in this moment, the people in this story, apparently Jesus was able to see in their heart and they did what we often do when we see a big problem in our life. When we see something we need to repent of, we go I'm going to do that. I'm going to put it on the calendar for someday. I will do that someday. I have heard this from people about giving their whole life to God. One of um, John, the announcement guy, his good friends, he, John was talking to his friend, and his friend said, I don't really know what I believe. I don't really know if I believe in God. I don't really know about Jesus. I don't know about any of that stuff. And then randomly on his own, this is a true story, unrelated to the sermon, randomly on his own, the friend goes, but if I found out that uh, I was dying, you can bet I'd start praying to Jesus. 
True story. But he's putting it off. He's saying, I'm going to do that on someday. I'll deal with that later. And we do the same thing with the issues in our life. We say, I'll deal with it later. So Jesus then says, okay, I want to deal with that. I want to deal with your tendency to push things off and say, I'll deal with it later. He's saying, you got to deal with it now. So he tells a parable. A parable. If you don't know what this is, it's just a story to make a point. It's a made up story to make a point. It's like an illustration. And Jesus says, here's how you got to think about putting this stuff off. And as you hear this, I want you to think, what are you putting off? What are you saving for someday? What are you pushing off until later? Here's what Jesus says. Then he, that's Jesus, told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. On Facebook, a few weeks ago, I posted something that said, has anybody grown fig trees? Because I don't know anything about fig trees. And all these people responded. They're like, why are you asking about fig trees on Facebook? Are you going to grow a fig tree in your apartment? And I was like, no, it's because I was researching for this passage. I don't know anything about fig trees. But the people in this story would have known immediately both about fig trees in real life, but also the metaphor that Jesus was using to get their attention. All throughout the Bible that was written before Jesus came, and all throughout the part of the Bible that was written about Jesus and after Jesus came, the whole Bible uses this metaphor of fruit. Fruit in the Bible is what happens when somebody is turned away from God and they decide to turn back to God. And when they turn back to God, God works in them and they change, and they become a different kind of person, and God starts using them to do amazing things that they could have never done before. That changing of a human being, the Bible uses the metaphor of fruit to describe. So when Jesus says there was a fig tree growing in his vineyard, that he, and he went to look for fruit on it but did not find any, the people hearing this would have said, Jesus is talking about a person who is turned away from God. A person who is saying no to God, who is saying, I don't need that right now. Everyone's checking with him already. So the man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. That's the man we're going to call the owner, the owner of the vineyard. Then here's what happens next. So he, the owner, said to the man who took care of the vineyard, who we're going to call the gardener, the owner says to the gardener, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? If you don't know much about fig trees, for the fig tree to have gone three years without bearing fruit means this owner is super late in dealing with the problem. That means the owner went, he went in the garden, he took a fig seed, planted it in the ground, waited for the tree to grow up, watched when all the other trees in the garden were bearing fruit, watched when all the other trees in the garden were at maturity, and then he went to look at this particular fig tree, and he goes, huh, no fruit. Now, he knows what he's doing, and he sees that everything else is bearing fruit, so right then would have been the great time to pull up the tree and start over. But he says, ah, the owner says, ah, I'll wait one more year. So he goes back to his house, waits for another harvest season, waits for the rain, all that stuff. Second year, goes back to the tree, and he goes, any fruit? No fruit. Now, at this point, he definitely should pull it up and get rid of it. But he says, I guess I'll just wait one more year. I don't want to go through the whole hassle of pulling it up putting something new in, so he goes back again to his home, waits for the third year, rain, seasons, comes back, third year, still no fruit. And at this point, he calls the gardener and goes, okay, we got to just get rid of this tree. What's the point of the story? We feel like we have forever. We feel like we've got all this time. We feel like we've got all the time we need to deal with the things that God wants us to deal with. Jesus tells his story to say, from an objective outside perspective, you are so late. It's not even like the counter has run down. It's like the counter ran down a long time ago. You're way over time. It's three years past when you should have dealt with this thing. And this, that like sounds like 
you know, a little intense, but think about it. This is how we see each other. When you see your friends with issues in their life that are bringing them down, that they need to work on, that they need to change, you would never say to them, just take your time on that. You've got all the time you need. Just don't worry about it for now. Anytime you see a big issue in someone's life, you're like, now is the time you have to deal with this right now. But then in our own lives, we go, eh, I got time. I want to put that off. Jesus is saying the instinct you have with other people, you need to apply to yourself. He's saying from an outside divine perspective, we are so late in dealing with our marriages and dealing with our finances and dealing with the unforgiveness in our lives and dealing with our addictions and dealing with our lack of participating in the things that we know God wants to participate, us to participate in lack of reaching out to people that we know God wants us to reach out to. Anything that you can say, yeah, I'm pretty sure God wants me to do that. From God's perspective, you are out of time. The people in this story would have heard we are out of time to turn to God for the first time. But if you're here and you've already turned to God, don't hear this and go, well, yeah, Jesus had a sense of urgency because they weren't Christians yet. But he doesn't have a sense of urgency for me for the things I haven't repented of. It's the same Jesus. It's the same God. He's not like, take, he's not like, you need to come into a relationship with me right away, but take your time with everything else. He's saying, now is the time. Now is the time to repent, to turn to me, to bring to me all that you are. This is where we get to see, though, this next part of the parable, Jesus just be so good, so loving, so kind. Because in the story, it makes complete sense to cut out this tree and be done with it. And on some level, that same thing is true for us. When we refuse God, when we refuse to change, God is right to say, okay, I'm done with you. But look at what Jesus does out of a love for you and me and this little tree. Look what happens. So the man, this is the gardener, and the gardener represents Jesus in this parable. I didn't really say that yet, but the, the gardener represents Jesus and God's grace in giving us Jesus. So the man, the gardener replies, says, leave it alone for one more year. To which the owner would be like, we've already waited three years. We're so far past the point. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Jesus asks for more time. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus is loving. Jesus looks at the little tree that's so far gone, that little tree that represents you and me. When we say no to change, when we say no to God, when from God's perspective or a divine perspective, we are so late in turning to God, Jesus says, no, 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 no. Leave me alone with this little tree. I want to make this tree live. I want to make this tree bear fruit. I'm going to get this tree back to life. No one else has hope for this tree. Jesus does. There may be people that you feel like don't have hope for your life. Maybe you don't have hope for your life. Jesus has hope for your life. He says, just give me a little time and I can turn this tree that's growing but not bearing fruit, not nearly the tree that it's supposed to be, and I can make it into the tree that it's meant to be. Jesus is all about this little tree. So he says, give me a shovel. I'm digging, and he starts digging around the tree. This was a practice that they would do to cut the roots of the tree. They dig all around the outside of the tree to cut the roots because when you cut the roots of the tree, it was like a last-ditched attempt to get the roots to grow deeper. That when the roots sensed that they had been cut, they would go, I don't have the access to the nutrients that I had, and they would grow deeper into the ground, and sometimes that growing deeper would cause the tree to bear fruit. And then Jesus goes, give me some of that fertilizer. Give me some of that manure, and he starts pouring it around the tree into the place that he dug, most likely. Fig trees don't even really need manure. But Jesus is saying, let me do 
everything that I can possibly do to get this tree to become the tree that it was meant to become. And that's what Jesus says to you and to me. He is not indifferent. He's not the owner of the garden that says, whatever, it's not worth the risk. Jesus says, I am after you. I love you. Look, what? Like, why would the gardener be all about this little tree? He's already got to dig around it to try to get it to live. He might as well just dig around it to get rid of it. But Jesus says, I'm into this tree. I like this tree. I like this little tree, and it's going to live even if I got to hurt my back, break a sweat, and put manure into it. That's how Jesus feels about you. He's saying, I will invest myself. I will ask for more time for you. I will do whatever I can to get you to live and grow and turn to God because I love you. And isn't that what Jesus did when he came to earth? Did he not drip sweat in the garden before he went to the cross, sitting in the garden, dripping sweat that looked like drops of blood, willing to do it? Willing to do it for us. That's what he did when he went to the cross. He said, I am going to invest myself, my time, my energy to try to get this tree to be all that it was meant to be. And the same thing is true for me and you. Jesus is invested all the way. He's invested in you that way. If you're far from God, he's invested in you that way. Gosh, I keep hearing more and more stories about people who do not believe in God at all, having supernatural encounters with Jesus. This is happening all over the Muslim world. Our youth pastor, Luke Zika, went to visit a church in Turkey, and he walked into the church, and the pastor said about half of the people in our church just showed up at our door after Jesus showed up to them in a vision. That's Jesus digging at their roots. That's Jesus fertilizing them, saying, I want a relationship with you. And listen, I've been starting to hear stories like that all over Madison. There are people in our church who came into a relationship with Jesus who did not believe in Jesus at all. And they had visions or dreams of God and said, I need to go figure this out. That was Jesus cutting their roots. This wasn't just what he did back in the day a long time ago when he came here 2,000 years ago. Jesus came, and he's still doing that today by the power of his spirit through supernatural means all over the world. If you're here today and you've had that kind of experience, that was Jesus cutting your roots. Don't dismiss it. Don't deny it. Don't say maybe it was just some random thing. That's Jesus after you because he loves you, because he does not want you to get cut down, because he does not want you to get uprooted. It's like, um, like, you know, some of this stuff sounds so intense, but it's like if you go to a doctor, uh, okay, like I had, a, I had a friend who um, his kid had a punctured appendix, and when that happens, it's very bad, um, and she got really sick with the flu, and what happens is when you, you get sick with the flu, and then you just die. But she, like, in, like, three days when that happens. But when it happened to her, she um, went to the doctor for the flu. If she had waited a little bit longer, she would have died. But she went to the doctor. They do the scan or whatever. And the doctor's like, you are dying right now. And they took her into emergency surgery and saved her life. That's who Jesus is. When he says to you, you are dying, he's not like, you're dying and I don't care. He's like, you are dying and I am going to do everything I possibly can to save your life. That's who he is. If you have trouble believing in God that would allow people to perish, you cannot believe in a God. You're not allowed, according to Jesus, to believe in a God who would allow people to perish without, without also believing in a God who doesn't want them to, a God who sends his son, a God who sacrifices his son so that you can live for eternity with him because he loves you, because he wants a relationship with you, because he wants the little tree to live. This is a, a summary of what Jesus is saying is this. I'm working on you like you've got a year left. I'm working on you like you've got a year left. A year that I asked for on your behalf. But see how different this is? We like to live like we have all the time in the world to turn to God, all the time in the world to deal with our stuff, all the time in the world to change. And Jesus says, I have a sense of urgency with your life. I got no time left. I asked for another year, and I'm doing everything I can to bring you to where you need to be right now. 
This is a sprint, not a marathon. So this is my challenge for everybody here today, is live like you have a year left. What would you do differently if you knew you only had a year to live? If you've been saying, I don't know about God, I don't know about church, I don't want to think about that, I can bet a lot of you, if you found out you were dying in one year, you would be turning to God and going, okay, I got to figure this thing out. Maybe you wouldn't be ready to give your life to Jesus today, but you'd be like, I'm going after it. But some of you would be ready to give your life to Jesus right now because you know, you know it's true. You know that he was who he says he goes. You know these saved. You've just been putting it off. Jesus is saying, don't put it off. Live like you have a year left. Come to him now, right now. But what else? Some of you, if you knew you had a year to live, just like that little tree, just like Jesus said, okay, I'm giving you one more year, you'd be like, I don't want to die with a broken marriage. I don't want to die addicted to this thing. I don't want to die with unforgiveness in my life. I don't want to die without having addressed that thing. I don't want to die without dealing with my stuff. If less time would make you more proactive, Jesus says, choose to be proactive now. Live like you've got a year left. Whatever you're saying someday about, do now. Whatever you're saying maybe someday, do it right now. Now, whether it's turning to God for the first time or bringing whatever you've been holding back from God to God, do that thing right now. You guys know the country song? It's like, I went skydiving. I went rocky mountain climbing. It's a song about a guy who decides what to do when he finds out he only has a short amount of time to live. And he chooses to do all these stupid things. He's like, I'm going to go skydiving. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, work on the things that matter most, the spiritual things, the thing that will last for eternity. Live like you have a year left. That person that you've been waiting to reach out to, to talk to you about Jesus because you think, I got plenty of time. Live like that person has a year left. Live like you've got a year left to talk to that person. Whatever it is in your life. We are called as stewards to be people of urgency. We are called to be people who do things now and don't wait. So I'm going to pray. Band, you can come back up. But as the band is up here, I want to give you a chance to give your life to Jesus today. If you are facing away from him, if you have not turned to him, I want to give you a chance to turn and give your life to Jesus today. And the way we're going to do that is I'm just going to say a prayer piece by piece And you can repeat it back silently. I'm not going to make you do it out loud. You don't have to do it out loud. Just say it silently in your heart, in your head. Just repeat the words after me. Um, So we're going to do that now, and then I'm going to say a couple more things. So if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, if you would give your life to Jesus today, if you knew that you were going to die in a year, give your life to Jesus today. And if you want to do it, repeat this after me. Don't say it out loud. Just say it in your heart. Say it in your head. Dear Jesus, I acknowledge that I have sinned. I have sinned against God. I have turned away from you, God. And today I turn back to you. I thank you for sending Jesus as a sacrifice for my sins. I thank you that you offer forgiveness freely. And as I say yes to you, thank you that you say yes to me in return. God, I give my whole life to you. I turn to you. I give you control of all of me. And I thank you that you love me and you're with me. And I thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you just prayed that prayer, you do not have to tell anyone. You are not required to. If you prayed that prayer, though, heaven is just rejoicing, so stoked 
so excited for you. And if you're willing, we would love for you to let us know so that we can help you down the journey, help you grow, help you learn. We're not going to ask you to raise your hand, but we're going to we're going to do what I think is the least awkward way for you to tell us that you decided to give your life to Jesus today. So what we're going to do is every single person in here, pull out one of those connection cards in front of you. Every single person right now, right now, pull out one of those connection cards in the back of the pew in front of you. Every single person, pull out a connection card, grab a pen. Everybody in here, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, pull out the connection card. Because if I say pull out the connection card and write down that you gave your life to Jesus, everyone's going to be looking over at you while you start writing. (laughs) So what we're going to do is we're all going to fill out a connection card. If you gave your life to Jesus and you'd like to let us know, you can write down your email, your phone number, your name, and say, I prayed to become a Christian today, or however you want to say it. I decided to follow Jesus. Whatever you want to say, write it down there, and I personally will follow up with you. I figured it would make sense for me to be the one to follow up since I'm the one who just talked this whole time and that way you know who's calling you and it's not some stranger calling or emailing you. If you'd rather just have email, that's fine. You can just write in your email. Everybody else who either didn't give their life to Jesus today or, or already is a Christian, just write down a prayer request or draw a smiley face or whatever you want to do. Write down something that's on your heart or, or tell me something I should have said differently up here. I always get those emails too. Here's something you could have done better. Write down whatever you want to write down, and then we'll go through all of them, and we'll find the ones that say, hey, I gave my life to Jesus today, and we'll follow up with you. If you don't want to say that you did, you can just write something else down. And uh, as you guys are filling those out, I'll pray one more time, and then we're going to sing a song. God, thanks again for this morning. Thanks for everybody here. God, we thank you for the people that said yes to you today. And uh, we thank you that heaven is rejoicing, God, because you do not want anyone to perish, but every single person to come to repentance, to come into a relationship with you. So I, um, I thank you for that. And God, we love you. And we sing to you. We praise you. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for sending your son to work in us, work on us, and bring us into a relationship with you. Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to sing and then when you leave, before you get outside at every exit, there's going to be a little basket. Just drop the card right in there and we'll